Alright, hello everyone. Um, I'm Ben Lupton and this talk's going to be Beverly's client side approach to <laughs> Beverly's approach to client side JavaScript and it's just going to be a showcase and a discussion of how Beverly, which is my company, which does a whole bunch of open source projects on GitHub, actually approaches doing client side JavaScript. Now we're being hosted right now by Hacker Tree. They're a pretty cool company. Um, that is like a school for students. You learn about how to be a better programmer over the course of three months, and they fly mentors in around the world. Now, Hacker Retreat's being sponsored by um, Xanox, so everyone can say thank you to Xanox for sponsoring this and getting me to fly over. Now, if you want to chime in, um, you can follow the slides here, they're all published, which is all nice, and leave issues if you think they're crap, or pull requests if you think you can make it better. So why am I doing this talk? Well, Kai, one of the Hacker Retreat um, co-founders, was insisting on it, because on Saturday I was helping out a guy who looks just like Bill Murray <laughs> um, convert his small, tiny application about maybe 300 lines of JavaScript into an MVC type um, architecture, an architecture that he could scale and provide a bigger application down the line, and just something that uses best practices. So the idea with that is, you know, after about half an hour, we had it rewritten in Spine, um, a MVC framework for JavaScript that I've come to a like and we had jQuery and we had, um, I think eventually we started using Backbones for the models later on. But it went over for a course of the day and then eventually we had about three people actually looking and overhearing this conversation. So Kai was like, hey, you know, it's helped out Bill Murray, so we might as well see if it can help out other people as well. So what qualifies uh, myself to actually have any opinion on this or why would my opinion matter? So I've actually been doing JavaScript for a very long time, um, probably since 2006, and I started doing a lot of Ajax and I was filling with prototype and MU tools, which were actually around before jQuery. jQuery hasn't always been around. Um, jQuery came out in 2006 and I jumped on board then. And I started building some really nifty things. I built like the first Lightbox plugin for jQuery. Um, and I also built a library called jQuery Smarty, which became, um, from my awareness, it was the first JavaScript templating engine. Um, and it was also reactive as well. So there was a templating engine for PHP called Smarty. And what you would do is you would define your syntax like this and it would convert it to this by passing over some template data. And it was actually, it supports like modifiers or template helpers in the terms of this, which takes in the formatting of the previous thing. And you can combine the template helpers with other stuff and do conditionals. So it was actually really powerful. It implemented just the same thing that PHP Smarty did. And you could define other views. Now, it actually was reactive as well. So here we say, okay, show the title, but if there is no title, then say there isn't any title, so like that. But if we actually just adjust the template data, then it just updates this. It doesn't have to re-render the entire page. And this was pretty interesting. So I've, I've you know, started doing this, and then what's happened is now when it comes to templating, we actually have a whole bunch of different ways to do it. We have handlebars, echo, uh, mustache, Facebook React Knockout, Vanilla jQuery, um, and a whole bunch of libraries. And it's interesting to see it from like a point of view of, I tried these things such a long time ago and how they're developing and how people are still running into some of the same issues. In 2009, I switched from being a PHP developer part-time and JavaScript part-time into JavaScript full-time, which was pretty early for JavaScript people to do that, but it was, it got me a lot of work very quickly which was really interesting. Um, there was a HTML5 editor. Um, this was the first project that made content editable, actually noticeable, so you could actually edit a website by just clicking and editing it. So I helped that project out for a few months, um, and I ended up creating a build library for them called Builder. Now, Builder is kind of like Grunt was, um, where you can um, build your website, do all this stuff, 
and Grunt came out, which was more modular than this. This only did compilation, minification, and minting, when Grunt is very extendable. But before we used Builder, we actually used one called Ant um, that I'll mention on. 2011 was actually a big year. I, I built History.js that's gone on to be one of the top most popular JavaScript projects and I also built Docpad um, which is now a project I still work on. I started CoffeeScript and I started this project called Task Group which is our approach to handling asynchronous and parallel and serial tasks um, and I go into that a bit later. And I started using Backbone then. From there I actually implemented Backbone in a few government projects um, that went over the course of a year and that was quite successful but there was actually a startup called Bughood, and I was contracted to rebuild the application using Backbone JS before they were doing just vanilla JavaScript and a bunch of Ruby developers. Now, what's amazing about this is it uses a project called Query Engine that we also developed um, to make these querying. So that's one collection, that's one collection, that's one collection, that's one collection. Now, all of these collections are part of a child collection of this collection. This collection, this collection, this collection, a child collection of all the tasks, right? So if we imagine the global task collection, then we have these child collections, and then for each of these, we have these child collections. Now, if we're clicking between these and we're querying like a thousand tasks all at once, then that can really slow down your browser, especially if we have to support old browsers which don't have the latest JavaScript optimizations. So we had to come up with some pretty innovative ways to work around that and we're still using the query engine project um, today in a lot of pro like other projects and applications. At the same time, we rewrote Docpad, which is the Node.js CMS I created a year earlier um, to use Backbone instead of just vanilla JavaScript classes. 2013, this year, I moved on to Docpad full time um, through the sponsorship of My Planet Digital. Um, and I also, before that, at the beginning of the year, we actually had two failed projects um, with Backbone. And that was maybe over the course of three months or four months. And it was actually really interesting because Backbone, around this time, around 2012, other projects started coming out like um, Angular and um, what else, Ember.js as well, um, which I'll go in. But what happened was we also hit Backbone and then Backbone was like, oh, you know, it's really, really great. And then it started falling down. People actually started having problems with Backbone. Backbone was probably the first big MVC framework, um, but then we started running into problems and then people started looking to these other frameworks as well, um, or to hacks that added on to Backbone. So I started looking into alternatives. I looked into Chaplin, Angular, Ember, all of those, and I ended up discovering a project that I quite like called Spine. Um, although the models in it sucked. <laughs> its views were really good, but the models sucked. And I discovered a project um, or initiative called MicroJS, which is about, instead of doing monolithic libraries, you break it down into tiny, tiny little libraries. And when I went out to build this project called Inline GUI, which is an admin interface um, that has a lot of cool tech in it, which I'll be demoing, I actually looked into using MicroJS um, and if we see like on the issues, we'll actually find out that, okay, um, da, 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 let's use Spine, move from Spine to Component. So Component is one of these MicroJS package managers and eventually, um, see be often to do, da, da, da. yeah, so this is like my diary entries for, for trying to use MicroJS. This idea failed. There seems to be no examples for events, blah, blah, blah. I found observable, but it, it's just going to, I spent all my time just researching libraries and just finding out that when you start doing MicroJS, doing these tiny little components, what happens is you lose context. And that's something that Ember and Angular have really good because it's one convention for doing everything and everyone abides by that convention. When with micro, it's, everyone does it their own way. And you also find out that you may research all these things, but they're either incompatible or they end up including a whole bunch of libraries anyway, right? So you may include like one view framework and then another, like a jQuery calendar widget or like a calendar widget, and then you may include a 
um, like a modal widget and then they'll use different selector engines and the, the purpose of using MicroJS to keep your JavaScript down small becomes useless. Um, so component was kind of for the MicroJS way. Um, Bower is more popular, I guess, um, but it they're both too complex, I found, um, over time. And I, I've got some opinions about this later, but eventually I've ended up coming up with this, this approach. And I actually quite like it. I, I think it's really nifty. Um, so I'll go into that and just find out, you know, why we like it. So I'll probably just start off by what's, what's the admin interface that I have been building in the last few months. So this is a, a decoupled admin interface. Now what that means is that the, the, this admin interface can hook into any backend as long as it implements a particular specification. So the project is called WebWrite and that admin interface is called Inline GUI. But we define this REST API spec that any backend could implement. It could be WordPress, it could be Tumblr, it could be another static site generator. Um, it could just be the file system. So anything that adds this REST API, we can just communicate with it. So you add the location of the site and it'll go. So right now this is just gonna pop up a docpad website and then these are all the files on that docpad website. And I have different collections, so files, um, documents, HTML documents, and these are using Query Engine right now to fetch. And then we can start editing our website. We use content editable, whoops, wrong hockey. We use content editable here. And we start noticing something interesting. If when I update this, this updates and this updates, and that's kind of called reactive templating. Um, and that can be a very complicated problem. And also when we go here, we also want it so if, a, a, if someone else is editing the website and then they delete one of these documents, then we should be able to see that right away and the, the view should re-render itself um, but just re remove the one element that's been deleted, the one file that's been deleted, not re-render the entire list. Um, and that's also important when you're editing forms because like say if someone updates a published date um, and they save it and I'm typing something here, then I don't want everything to, that I'm working on to be destroyed as well. I just want the things that they've been doing to update. So that's, that's it, it, there's a lot of cool tech in this. Um, so I actually, now I'll just talk about the ways um, people generally go about their web architectures on the client side, the different frameworks there are and some opinions about them. And then I'll talk about the approach that we use. Um, I'll probably take some questions now if anyone has them before we continue further. Any questions? Good. I'm doing a great job. <laughs> so, for building a project, originally there was Make, and Make's like a build tool that started off probably being used for just non-client side stuff, just any type of application. We use this in university to compile Java applications. Um, and the, it's written in shell and the reason why we don't use it for client side development is it's not that friendly to web developers. We like to use languages that we know um, and we like to be able to extend it and do all our nice stuff. But if we're wrestling with shell and we have to learn shell, it's not going to be that fun or applicable to web developers. Then the, to cr try and create like a more um, robust version of Make, there's a project called Ant. But with Ant, you end up with just like this gigantic, huge XML file um, as a configuration file, which kind of looks like this. And if you have like a trying to compile low high editor as we were trying to do, you end up just writing your entire program just in XML and it becomes like 3,000 lines long. And it's not that interesting. So then when I was working with the Loha editor, they actually got me to make the project called Builder. Um, but these days, you might as well use Grunt. Grunt's kind of like the successor to Builder. I stopped working on it. Now Grunt, Grunt's approach is you install NPM modules. Um, 
and you just run your task. But you have a configuration file. You installed a new grunt module. Um, you then update your configuration file to say, okay, this is how to minify it. This is the files I want minified. Um, Brunch is kind of like grunt, but it's made in CoffeeScript. And then you have this thing called Cake, um, which is like make files, but just coded in CoffeeScript. And you can include node modules and things like that. Now, the I've categorized these in task-based build tools because they just, you enter a command, they run that command and they die. Um, so for grunt, every command just interacts with the file system or interacts with the result of the previous one. They don't stay alive, they just do a task and die. Um, and I put docpad in this resource-based build tools, which is, it actually stays alive, it's got a you run it, it passes the entire database. Plugins can hook into particular steps as it's going along, rather than you having to order the task in the way you want to do it. So instead, events are emitted and you just respond to the events you want to work with. And it's actually turned out pretty good. Um, now, obviously, I would probably recommend you use whichever one you're probably already using. But if you're going about a new project, it's it's good to be aware that there are different options and just pick a good option that is fitting for you. For us, we've always liked Docpad and we also use Cake. So we use Cake to compile um, generally CoffeeScript projects, things like that, but we also use Docpad to compile some projects. So we use Docpad to compile Query Engine, um, like some back-end projects, but Docpad we mostly use for client-side development, which is what it's made for. Now in preprocessors, um, I've categorized um, them in HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. Now, probably everyone is using preprocessors these days because they do allow you to state more of your intention and less how to do it, which is a good Unix philosophy. It's one of the Unix philosophies is to use generators. Um, so you state more of your intention because if we are stating more of how to do things, then there's more chance of human error. Um, which we don't want. So there's these projects, jQuery, Jade, and Handlebars. Now, when I created jQuery Smarty, about a year into it, I actually realized Smarty was actually not the solution. And this website came out called No Smarty. And then all the PHP developers were like, oh, okay, um, Smarty isn't actually good. It's not a good tool because um, it, it I'll sum it up, but they go into really good details. But essentially, you end up creating this new, very limited interpreted syntax. And the reason why you do this is to stop templating errors, so stop a designer from doing something nasty, right? So your logic should be kept to developers and the designer should be kept to HTML and CSS. But the problem is it's solving a problem of we don't want templating errors but it's solving it with a new limited syntax rather than just solving it with a better language test and training your developers. So empowering the developers is a good way to do it rather than chastising them um, and handcuffing them. So then there's tools like Echo, which is kind of like ERB and PHTML. Um, and Echo is just CoffeeScript embedded in the template. So now the, the designers have power, they can apply the abstractions without having to say, hey, developer, can you please code me a for loop on the project's object, right? Which is what you had to do in these other type of libraries with coding helpers. But now we actually have the power of CoffeeScript um, inside our templates and CoffeeScript's pretty easy. Now, then we can take it a step further and actually use like a templating engine like CoffeeCup, which everything is now CoffeeScript which is pretty crazy, but the advantages here is you can actually start doing things like that, where you can start combining the power of CoffeeScript to actually render parts of your HTML. So I could do like a, you know, output this, like a P, wait, I need to scroll down. So do a whole bunch of numbers, so let's do a for loop, and now I've got a whole bunch. Now it's similar to Echo, um, but in Echo I'd have to write like a for loop like this, and do it when coffee cup, I can just do it with a nice coffee script <coughs> syntax. Now for JavaScript, there's coffee script, live script, and closure script. Now I'd probably say use whichever one is best. I personally like coffee script because it's very expressive and 
I like the expressiveness. Like I'm just I, I like to the freedom, and that's why I love JavaScript so much. When I think for these people, these are people who hate JavaScript. <laughs> um, and finally, we have CSS preprocessors. Big ones are less CSS, SAS, and Stylus. Now, less CSS was maybe one of the first first JavaScript ones. There's also been ones in PHP. I think the first one was CSS Scaffold, which was a PHP project many, many years ago. Um, now, less CSS is just like JavaScript um, or just like normal CSS. It's not that expressive. Stylus is a bit more expressive. Like everything's optional, um, even like that and the braces, and it can enhance like do the stuff for you, the browser prefixes. And then we have SAS. And now the reason why I don't use SAS, I think SAS is terrific, but if I'm doing a whole lot of JavaScript tools, then executing Ruby code really slows the build process down. Um, where if I keep everything JavaScript. Um, the build process is a lot faster if I'm primarily working with JavaScript during my build phase. Now, if we're going about packaging, the, the ones available are Bow Component, um, NPM Browser Find Ender. Now, I've grouped all these together because they all use the NPM registry. Now, the way these operate um, is actually, well, the way Bow operates is it clones out the Git repository um, and then if you're doing generators, if you're utilizing preprocessors, then you need to get the, the person's computer who then installs your package to do the build process. Um, so if you've got a large project, then there's a lot of building that can go on. And if they don't have all the build dependencies installed, then your project's not going to build properly. So generally, the, the way that you just go about doing it in Bow and Component is you just commit your build files to the repository. And this is starting to seem like a, a bit of a, a weird way to do things. So component just says, don't use preprocessors, right? But then you lose all the advantages of preprocessors. When Bauer says, use preprocessors, but compile it, right? Um, now, NPM has become incredibly popular. They're, they're even more popular than Gems now, which is amazing, the Ruby Gems project. And then one of the reasons for this is that with NPM, you, you compile your project locally and then you publish the build files to the NPM registry. Now, what that means is that when somebody wants to use your project, they just do NPM install the project and they get the build files. There is no compilation step that needs to run on the user's computer. And to compile code for the client side, there's two tools, Browserify and Ender. They go about in different ways. Ender is kind of like the NPM version of Bower, and Browserify is more familiar to Node developers a bit, or allows you a bit more control over the build process. Now, for DOM, we have jQuery and Zepto, then we have all these MicroJS selector engines, which I talked about earlier. Um, honestly, I've always seen that people will generally just fall back to jQuery or Zepto. Um, for the select engines and because when they use these you end up with a problem I talked about before which is one module will use one select engine another module will use another selector engine and it defeats the entire purpose <laughs> of doing it that way which is unfortunate but it's just the way it is now for business logic there's Backbone, Spine, Ember and Angular and there's also this new project, MiniView, which is what we use in the inline GUI project. Now, what's interesting about Backbone is, like I said before, we had these failed projects. And the reason they failed is the views. Now, in Backbone, the models and the collections are fantastic. They're really amazing to deal with. But doing views, you actually have to make sure the garbage collection is handled correctly. Your views are rendered correctly. And what I mean by this is, when you're rendering your entire application, like you can use the backbone views um, up front, but say six months into your application, you may start having performance problems. And what that could be is you just haven't cleaned up your views correctly. You've gone about implementing your application and it's gone through and destroyed a whole bunch of views. You've rendered a few listings, like say 15 minutes in the application of the usage. All the views that were used but then removed from the DOM, they could still have 
events bound or they may not be <coughs> just have dangling references in memory which will stop the garbage collection from actually collecting it and then freeing it from memory so your application can just completely slow down and the other issue with it is if you're on mobile you have to be very careful with the way you render your views now backbone it just gives you the view object it doesn't give you any abilities out of the box for rendering lists with views that's something you have to handle yourself um, it's just very bare bone or very backbone right um, so you end up writing your own custom stuff for handling you know rendering a list with a particular list item view now the problem there is you're introducing custom code rather than using pre-made code and when you introduce custom code you also increase your risk for error um, and one of the common errors is if we're rendering our application um, if we render I'll go to the inline GUI and I'll do it as a more visual thing so if we're rendering this list there's two ways we can render it one is a bottom up approach and one way is a top down approach now a top down approach would render the entire application now it would render this list then once it's rendered this list it would render this, render this, render this, render this, render this, render this and you would actually see the list going do 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 right now the problem with performance is the DOM manipulations is the most intensive thing that will happen on the client side it is the slowest thing um, so if you're rendering attaching things to the DOM as you're doing it um, in this top down to render the app, render this page, render each item in the list so you see it all happening, that's a lot of DOM operations. Now modifying the DOM in memory however incredibly fast. The reason why is you don't have to keep repainting what the users see. So the other approach to rendering is a bottom up approach which is render, render all of the items in the list, so render this, render this, render this then what you do is then you render the page and then you attach the then you render the application and then you attach the application to the body so they when it gets to the body when the paint happens your entire application is already rendered right so for mobile performance that becomes very important but if you're developing your application at the beginning um, and just on the desktop you may not notice this and this is something incredibly difficult to fix if you're using custom code for building your application to render list views. So what people have generally done to avoid this is they've come up with so many um, ways to go about um, handling or dealing with the crappiness of backbone views, right? So if I probably, maybe let's see view, right? There's a lot of projects that all try and fix the badness of backbone views. And then we have more full-fledged frameworks which is Marionette and Chaplin. Um, now I like Chaplin because one of the things they actually say, I'm not sure whether they still say it, da, da, da. but before they used to say um, they had a tagline which was we actually care about their strict memory management and object disposal, <laughs> right? So it's something that they actually care about from the very beginning. Um, when Backbone is like, that's for you, that's for you to figure out. So people who generally use Backbone, then they end up using Marionette or Chaplin to try and fix this. Or they just deal with the problems in their custom code and eventually start crying um, at night time because the project failed, right? So the other solution, if you're going into it, um, is Ember and Angular. Now, Angular is a, a Google project and Ember is just like a community project. They're both community projects, but it's probably who's giving the big funding, I guess, behind it. Um, so, these are more just like full-fledged frameworks for doing web development on the client side, which is why they say framework, a framework, um, when just back when it's just MVC, like it's just models, views, collections, it's not a framework. Um, for doing ambitious web applications, which is a really good tagline for Ember. Now, if you're coming new to JavaScript, then I would highly suggest um, probably using Ember or Angular. And the reason why is you get the community, you get a set of conventions that are tested, you get everything's already handled for you. Um, when if you're a JavaScript expert or you use JavaScript full time, then you can start doing these ultimate tweaks of using just specific frameworks. But if you're coming new, 
then it's a good idea to get started with a big community or big applications that take care of JavaScript memory collection, take care of problems in JavaScript that you don't have to deal with. Um, and I'll probably spend like another moment on that, which is um, JavaScript garden. A lot of times people actually think they, they are good at JavaScript and they there's a there's a difference between someone who does dark JavaScript full time and someone who delves into JavaScript. And the reason is JavaScript is very expressive and it can be like holding a gun or a double edged sword. And it's very easy to screw up um, doing things. Now JavaScript Garden is a project made by I think two or two Stack Overflow people who have like the highest ranks in JavaScript answers. And they created this because they kept answering the same problems again and again on Stack Overflow. So instead they created JavaScript Garden to say, this is how actually JavaScript works, right? This actually does different things um, depending on how it's called. And you can even overwrite what this means. And they talk all about the different problems with JavaScript. So. JavaScript as a language is, is quite a scary thing and if you're starting to build huge applications with it um, and you're using Backbone, you have to be very cautious. Um, so if you're using Backbone, there's these or you can just use something like Embrain Angular um, and you don't have to worry about those. Now if you are a bit more experienced or you are wanting, you're working with experienced developers or you're just wanting to do something very lightweight, then there are options available, and I think you know the the approach that we've ended up coming to is quite nice. Now, one is Spine, and Spine's very lightweight. It actually came by the guy who wrote the book about Backbone and just MVC in general for O'Reilly, um, and he used Spine as thinking all these these projects are being a bit complicated. So what would it be like to create something incredibly simple? So it's highly inspired by Backbone. But instead of doing views, um, it's got this idea. So Backbone has views and controllers as separate entities. When he says, well, everyone just ends up never using the controllers and they just end up using views in Backbone, which is true. Um, you, so he's just got this controller and it just does your, your views handling for you. But it's got a few interesting things. Like it does clean up memory pr quite well. Um, so when you destroy a view or release a view, it does clean it up, which is quite nice, and it gives you routing and things like that. The problem I ran into with Spine, if we look at the inline GUI um, issues, was I ended up just having struggles with the, um, the model library. Um, I think I ended up, maybe I said this, maybe I didn't. Um, move from Spine to Component, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So I ended up having problems with the model, so then I started looking at MicroJS, and then from MicroJS I was just like, okay, let's just use Backbone for the models and collections, and we'll keep using Spine for the controllers. Um, so I'll go into that in a bit. Now, for data logic, logic we have these, I kind of covered that, I guess, in the business logic. It's just what we want to use for our models. Now, templating um, is another aspect to this. If you use Ember or Angular, you probably have it already bundled inside itself. But if you're using your own stuff, then you may be using something like Jade, Handlebars, Mustache, or something, where you write your template in a special markup, and you're generally just too lazy, or it's just too inconvenient to render a specific portion. Because if you're writing... I have too many tabs open now. Um, so if we write our template like this, what happens if we now get a new model injected into our project's um, listing? Now we have to re-render the entire view, and that can get pretty slow. Or, you know, just, just to split everything out just becomes crazy, like you wouldn't have a view dedicated to that line, right? It just gets... Um, quite ridiculous if you want to use these types of approaches to actually create reactive templates that update when only a portion of the code or only a portion of the template instead. So then there's these projects called Facebook React and Knockout. Knockout's actually been a while, been around for quite some time, but you end up writing your HTML like this. <laughs> and it becomes a bit 
bit intense um, because it's another way where you have to learn a completely special syntax that's different from anything you've learned before just for the benefit of having effectively rendered templates right and it's the same thing with react if we want to use react then it's like okay let's define our template in javascript but what that's not a string how does that work what the hell is this right <laughs> and then it says okay we don't have to use this but it's optional so we end up doing a lot of crazy hacks for trying to accomplish um templates that only re-render a specific thing. So if we look into what this actually looks like, how they're accomplishing this, first they have a whole bunch of code just to do something so simple. And then the DOM gets populated with all these IDs or references on how, which things should map to which data properties in our database. So it starts getting a bit extreme. And it's kind of like the, the problem before, which is using these type of languages for preventing designers from making problems. Just empower your designers um, to write better code or use a cleaner language as well. So for us, um, we ended up coming up with a different way about doing this, which is called pointers. Now, this was just published today, <laughs> so the documentation is a bit abysmal. But if we imagine this as your backbone view or a spine view, um, you have your element defined like this and you have your classes. Now you cache these elements, so this is a selector, this just maps to this and then we cache it to the title variable on this. So if I just do um, at title, that means this.title in CoffeeScript and this.title is then a cached jQuery element of this. Right, so what we end up doing is item is the, the model we want. So we say point the model who's title and fall back to the name if the title isn't set to the element title. Now what will happen is if I change the title on the, the model, then this is automatically gonna update. Um, it's gonna update the, the thing here, which is what we saw when we started doing, I'll move this to like the very beginning. Here. So if we modify this, it does it there. Now, I was thinking whether I'm jumping ahead. I'm jumping ahead. I, I'll talk about how this all comes together really nicely. But if, you, if you're viewing this afterwards, then, then you can check it out as we go. So what we do, so for server side, communi communicating to the back end, that's also a big problem. Backbone provides a sync um, method that you will probably m always override <laughs> um, because it expects your API to perform exactly like that and your API is probably never going to perform exactly like that because people's applications are different and they get complicated. So you always end up overriding this um, and you also want to have error handling and things like that and it's just something you always end up overriding. Then you have Angular and Ember data um, which is just part of the, the big community or the big offering that they provide. So if you're using Ember, you're using Ember data. If you're using Angular, you're using Angular data. Now there's another way is, which is WebSockets, which is where the back end can actually communicate directly to the front end to say, hey, we now have a new model, or now, hey, we now have this change applied to this model. So the, the client side can actually stay completely up to date with what's happening on the back end when traditionally to accomplish that, we had to refresh our entire page or we had to continuously pull the back end, which was very ineffective. Um, and then we just had vanilla like jQuery Ajax instead. Now state management is also another aspect which you need to take into consideration when you're writing a, a big application. Now there's generally a few ways you go about this. GitHub uses a project called PJAX, which does history um, uses a HTML5 history API, which is also called push date. Um, and what you do is you write your HTML like this, say, okay, this should use PJAX. Um, so when this link is clicked, then swap this element out, right? More or less something like that. Um, 
Now that works very well with Rails because you have a whole bunch of Rails helpers such as TurboLinks to provide automatic solutions to this. Um, if you're using, um, not using Rails, then another option is History.js which also provides like an automatic way of going about this, um, which is this Ajaxify script. Or you can just use the History API, which is a bit similar to the official HTML5 History API, but there are some changes where you actually push the states of the application. Um, so that's the URL, that's the title of the page, and this is any state data associated to it. And you end up listening um, for different states here. So that's one option. If you're using a framework, then Angular, Ember, Backbone, Spine, they all contain their own routers to do this. Then you have, in the MicroJS world, you have a whole bunch of routers as well. Now the problem with these is that they, they're incredibly complicated um, that I found. Like Crossroads just seems to be the biggest one, but then I was just like, how do I use Crossroads, but then I include this other project called Hasher, which is the way MicroJS works. So then I have to learn about Hasher. Right? Everything depends on another micro module. And it started becoming too complicated. When for me, like I really like Spine's routing. I liked the controllers or the views of Spine. I like Spine's routing. So if we take all this knowledge, this big mess of fragmented JavaScript architecture, right, which is the current state, um, and then we think, okay, what would it actually be like to, to build an application in a, in a really nifty way? Um, we can actually end up with something pretty nice. So if we're going to build this, um, how can we actually build this really speedily? So first off, we would probably do our building. Um, because our building is going to allow us to get live reload, allow us to install preprocessors, allow us to have partials and abstractions as we're running our front end code, right? So, we would first install, for us, we would install Docpad, we would make our application, we would run Docpad. Now, when Docpad runs, it's actually going to ask us, hey, which skeleton do you want to use? And when we would actually say, hey, let's use HTML5 boilerplate. Right, and then that will actually clone out a HTML5 boilerplate application for us. So we just have our page. Oh, that's nice, so render your markdown quite well. But we have our layouts um, done. So we have all our abstractions already done. We can include our content, which is what is embedded into layout, add our side scripts to it. Um, add our side styles to it. And we just get a lot of stuff for free. Um, it will come by default, I think, with normalize um, CSS, modernizer, and HTML5 boilerplate and jQuery. So it gives us some stuff to start hacking on our site right away. And our configuration file for customizing just abstracted parts out of our website. So what styles does this website use, which scripts does this use. Um, and some template help is there. So it, it's a good start. But then if I want live reload functionality, I just have to do docpad install live reload. And now I have live reload. I'm enabled it. It happens immediately as soon as I make changes, then the docpad website's going to start refreshing, which is quite nice. Now if I want to use these, then I just install the plugins for it, the docpad plugins, and I get them, which is really quite nice. And I don't have to do any configuration like it would be with Grunt. With Grunt, if I install a plugin, I then have to add it to my Grunt configuration file. When we docpad, just install the plugin, you get access to it. Now, eventually I want to start using things like including Backbone, including Mini View, or writing my JavaScript. Um, now, what we would actually use, this should actually be another step. Let's flip this, let's reverse like 30 seconds, and I'll actually go, okay, next up is the DOM. Right, so you'll go about, you'll write your website, right, you'll start hacking on your HTML, you'll start hacking on your CSS, right, and eventually, that's in there, boop, boop, boop. So, this is the, the code for the inline GUI admin interface. This is using coffee cup. So I'll just copy that. Um, into coffee cups so people who aren't familiar can still understand what's going on. 
Right, so this is our applications um, index page. So it's still wrapped with the layout which embeds our scripts, our metadata, our styles. But we have our app. Then we have like our menu, um, the different elements of it. So our page editing, we have a text area, we have, why isn't this scrolling? Okay, so it is scrolling. Um, okay, I'm just gonna have to go back to the text editor because <laughs> that's not working too well. So essentially, we just write our template, we write our CSS without any JavaScript first. We just make sure it designs really good. We can, the designers can just go crazy. They can make sure that the interactions work okay. The, the layout is actually good. It's, it's actually going to be a good design um, before we start doing any JavaScript, right? Which is really good because the design changes. And if we just change, like, you know, code it up, we start into adding interactions and then like, well, this doesn't actually work that well, then it's like, okay, now it's a lot of effort to start rewriting our application. But if we can just do the HTML and the CSS right at the beginning and see exactly what our entire application is gonna look like, it's pretty powerful. So with all of this, like this would just work if I turn JavaScript off and I'll see everything. Um, so we actually have um, sample data. So I actually changed that back to localhost because I did that in testing, right? So that's like the modal, and I just see the modal inserted onto the page, and I can see what that looks like. And I can, this is my sites listing, and I will have uh, some sample websites implemented. So here I have localhost 9778 already added to it. Um, and I just say, okay, this is just gonna be called honored. So that's, where is this? That's the header row. So the location, and it's 978. Now for the listing, Side page list container page list. What's this site list? Oh, that's the site listing. I'm gonna get the application up so we can see how it controls to each other, and so I don't go crazy. So this code relates to this. This is the sites list, which is this, and then the localhost nine seven eight is this. But this is with it already working. Um, with the interactions and the JavaScript loaded. Now the page list, we click that, we go to our page list. Now we actually have some fake pages already inserted. Um, so a file title, things like that. So when we just code out the HTML and CSS, we can actually see, okay, this is what the form is gonna look like. And if I wanna test it with like a whole bunch of things, then I can be like, all right, for I in maybe zero to a hundred, right? or a thousand. Um, and then with the power of coffee cup and coffee script, then that's gonna render that file many, many times, right? So I can instantly start seeing, okay, this is what my application is gonna look like. It's just gonna add the, the stuff onto each other. So as kind of like a little example of what that would look like, um, app site, app ready, um, what's the other things I would add to it? Um, maybe app page, no, I broke it, <laughs> but what will happen is you'll get all your views added on top of each other and you can just see what it looks like. You have your edit stuff at the bottom and you can see, you know, add your default values. Now, what will then happen is it's now time to start writing your, your JavaScript. Um, and start adding a bunch more things onto it. So we would go back and now it's like, okay, let's add jQuery and we'll add some jQuery to it. And then we'll end up with like a gigantic big JavaScript file um, that adds the interactions as we go. So if we go to the commit history of this project, GitHub, WebRite, inline GUI, So this is, we just had a gigantic big JavaScript file at this stage called script.js.coffee. Um, and it just, at the beginning, it didn't use any MVC framework. We just had it, so it was very basic stuff, um, just using jQuery to uh, get some basic interaction going. So our designers can start seeing, oh yeah, this is how the interaction is gonna work. Um, and you know, it's actually gonna be pretty good, but it's not using any real data yet. It's just all using mock data, but we're using mock data with interactions. 
Now, the advantage of spine over something like, say, backbone views, or the spine approach to views, is that with backbone views, you need to start tearing out everything into different views. You can't just go take your gigantic big index.html file, which gives you a nice preview of everything, and start, you know, putting each thing into a view. Generally, what you end up doing is you would actually put this into like a different file, um, and you would call that like maybe wrap it in like a script tag with maybe like a special type, so it's like um, text as template, something like that, so it's not rendered. Um, and it starts, you have to start tearing your application apart once it's time to start developing it. And then when the designer is like, hey, how do I find out how something looks? Then it's like, well, too bad, that phase of development is now over. Um, we're now in the implementation stage. But the advantage of this is we can still have the big index.html file, but when we start doing our views, um, we just use the existing elements. So right now when we set up our application probably at the end I just tell it just bind itself bind the view to the app element that's already in the DOM um, and it's just going to start interacting with that instead so if we I think that's pretty good there um, does anyone have any questions so far is I need to take a drink I like it when no one has questions. It means that uh, everyone's understanding very well. So. Well, to have a high level question, so yep. Dockpad compared to other CMSs, yep. what's the, um, I guess, what was the intention? Like? What's the differentiation? In, like, from what I've seen of it, it seems like very dynamic and very flexible. You can just set up the content hierarchy very quickly. Yep. Start editing things directly. So that's the main benefit as opposed to something really heavy like Drupal or WordPress or Yeah. Yeah, so th the idea with Doctad is it's actually it's kind of like a, a rendering engine build tool, whatever you want to call it. But the way we just phrase it is it's just a web architecture. Um just a web architecture. But what it does is it takes this approach of um, a file-based CMS instead. So what that means is instead of requiring something like MongoDB or something like that at the beginning for your content, yeah. instead you can actually just query the files on your computer. Right? So if I have, like, say, a post directory, let's take my website, um, for instance. I can just set up a blog directory and then I can start querying all the items inside the blog directory by getting the collection posts, right? And then the post collection just says, okay, you should just be um, everything which will get to the outpath blog. So it actually allows you to start treating your, your documents or your files as if it's content. But in terms of a building perspective, um, it's really good for building because it generates like a static website you can use or you can start adding dynamic abilities onto it which is why it's more like this resource-based thing rather than a task-based thing where it spins up alive, it passes everything and you can actually interact with the content. So, yeah. But as a tool for building client-side apps, it's just a build tool. It's not gonna be a CMS. Um, but you can certainly use it as a CMS if you wanna do crazy things. Um, or at least crazy things in the definition of other CMSs. When in Dogpad, it can be really simple to do it. So, I talked about the, the spine views. So I ended up coming up with, I extracted the, the base, basicness of, of the spine views into a protocol called mini view. Now, the reason why I did this was I didn't, I was using backbone models and query engine collections and from backbone, but I was using just the views from spine and the routes from spine. So I was including all of Backbone and I was including all of Spine, when really I just wanted the views from Spine and the routes of Spine instead. So if we take a look at how Spine actually does its views, you have your element um, defined. Now, we could go about this in a different way. Um, so this is the element that is bound to the view. These are cached elements to avoid hitting, like querying the DOM every single time. 
and then these are events we buy. Now it's important to have the events defined like that rather than just doing it yourself because for the cleanup phase, if we destroy our view, then we're going to know how to destroy all the events correctly. So you don't end up with the garbage collection not being able to pull it up and you're just stacking up more memory. So when it has events, if I call like say then um, my edit view dot destroy, then it's gonna get rid of the the events and it's going to clean up and it's going to remove the elements so it's definitely going to clean up the view so if I then do submit form like if I you know add a title click um, the submit button on it um, then we're going to have submit form and that's just going to fire because we reference here and title has been cached to here because of this so it provides a really nice lean way of doing this now if we want to use this with the gigantic big index.html option which allows our designers to keep working on it even once we've started development of the interactions then what we can actually start doing is doing this type of thing instead so we define our element by fetching what the page edit element is in our big index.html file so we'll have page edit here so what will happen is as our JavaScript is going da 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 da, our index.html file is already there, it's already been given to the client, right? The, they already know about the DOM, but everything's kind of hidden away and we do that via the, the JavaScript at the beginning. So they don't see anything while it's loading. So we end up getting this. This then fetches where'd it go? So this then fetches this element. We've now selected this element. It removes it from the DOM. So we now pulled it out rather than having to, you know, extract this out into like a script tag or something so the user doesn't see it. So rather than doing like a hack like that, um, or doing something like saying style um, display none, or just some trick or hack so the user doesn't see this template. Instead, we just hide the DOM with CSS at the beginning while the application's loading. We grab this, we remove it from the DOM, so it's gonna do 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 fetch the element, remove it from the DOM. Now, with the element now in memory, fetch the first one, right? Because if we're doing a listing and we've got like 10 example records, then we want to just use the first one as, as our bind element to the view. We don't want our view now creating 10 different elements every single time. So remove all the elements that match that selector, grab the first one, and then grab the outer HTML out of it. Now, if we just do that, then they're all gonna be referencing the same element, right? Because of the way JavaScript deals with objects. Um, so they're all gonna be referencing the same element and it's all gonna fall down because they're all trying to modify the same element. If we do that as a string, now it's actually set as a string. So every single time you create the view, it's now creating a new element from that string. Right? No. Because we hide this um, from memory at the beginning. Um, I mean, hide it from view. So there isn't going to be any painting that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right? And then we remove it, and then this stuff now happens in memory here. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, if we approach that from like the, the script way, you know, it, it's still the same load, but it's just a much nicer approach doing it by this removal way rather than this hacky way, right? The only thing faster than this would be doing it by a way where we define our HTML inside our JavaScript like this. But the problem with that is then our designers can't work on the application and style the application without JavaScript, right? You need your JavaScript use to actually be able to see what your application is going to look like but you then you lose the benefits of using designers so that's how that works um, then we bind our elements and blah blah blah, blah. so that's pretty cool so as we're going through we um, we use our preprocessors we start using jQuery well we code out we code our application just so the designers can use it just the HTML just the CSS we then start using jQuery. We write our application with some basic interaction. The designers can still go happy. Then we add up, we, our developers, our JavaScript developers now get onto it. And then they start making it in like an MVC type way. 
Now we have a big gigantic JavaScript file that has everything. And now we've got everything going, but it's not with any real data. So now we actually have to start adding some real data to it. And then this is when we decide to use Backbone's models and we use Query Engine's collections. So Backbone will load up via um, just the typical way of injecting JavaScript these days, which is just via a script. So let's try it via a CDN first. And if the CDN fails, if we're offline or we're working on this on an aeroplane or whatever, then let's just use our cached copy of it on our local development machine or wherever it's hosted to. Now, Backbone requires underscore or low dash or something like that. So in this case, we're just using low dash. Um, I'm open to hearing a good comparison. Low dash is, I've heard is faster, but Christo has also said it's a lot more lines of code. So, so it will be interesting to see which one works, but they're both compatible with Backbone. So we load jQuery in, we load low dash, we load Backbone. Now it's getting pretty interesting. Now our developers are now starting, our JavaScript developers uh, have taken this and everyone can still keep working on the application while it's going through this phase. It's not, a, it's not, it's now in the past design phase, it's now in the development phase, goodbye designers. Everyone can keep working on it. So if we want to use Query Engine, just npm install Query Engine and we got it. We have CopyScript, class model, require backbone model, and class collection extent require engine. Um, collection, query collection. Now, what this does is this is the way we write Node.js apps, but this ability is really nice um, for client-side development um, because you don't have to use something like AMD or UMD or require JS to manage your applications. You can write your code as if it's just for um, in not really so it's just for, but in a nice way where you just install your dependencies like this and you can require them. So you, Query Engine and Backbone also run on Node.js. And you then use tools like Browserify to actually convert Node.js code to run directly in the browser, which is really interesting. So Query Engine works perfectly in the browser by going through this Browserify step. So now that we start having different files to use, we now start looking into this Browserify um, packaging option, which is npm and Browserify. So Browserify is this project. It's just like another build tool that you run on top of your JavaScript files. Um, and it's got like a very nice website. <laughs> um, but what's nifty about it is so I'll get up how we implement it in this admin interface. So this is like the good thing about Docpad. Here's our template data. Um, this is, you know, when we're doing development, set our template data to use our development URL instead. But like Docpad, because it's more like a resource thing than a task-based thing, we can hook in events. So once we started writing files, um, or one after we've started writing files, we actually want to pass our generated application file um, via Browserify. So Browserify should ignore Backbone, ignore Exoskeleton, ignore Underscore, ignore jQuery, because we are loading them up this way. We're not loading them up via NPM. We're loading them up the traditional way. But take our application JavaScript and then bundle it into this file. So it takes it all, bundles it all together into one nice file, so eventually you can just write the application as if it's like this. So let's require our views.app. And then in our application, we have you know the folder views and we have our application. Then we have a base thing and we require the stuff we need out of the different places. We have a utility library. Let's pull in wait and save from the utilities. So we get to start writing our application multiple files without having to worry about um, using something like AMD and polluting our namespace or just making everything global. Um, instead, we can actually use it and everything gets um, wrapped into a nice closure. You don't leak any globals. You get to include or know exactly how you know this file uses these dependencies and then this file will output the app class. And it works really quite well. And if we want to see the generated code um, by Browserify, then we end up with this. Um, so it'll actually pull in all the NPM dependencies that we reference. 
um, and put it all together in a nice file. Now, if I really wanted to, I could probably make this into a dockpad plugin and then pass it through um, Uglify or something like that to minify it. But that's like a later step that I'm not too worried about at this point. But it, it is really quite nice um, to use because you, you get these benefits. And if I want to use like a Node.js project or use Query Engine, then I can just be like, require Query Engine, let's use it, right? So it works quite well. And one of these will actually use a project I think called Task Group, which is like another project that runs on Node.js and it also runs on the client side. But it runs on client side because it just writes it as if it's a Node.js program and then browser if I converts it into running for the client side. So we get to start making use of tools that the Node community uses and also making them use for the client side. So that's how we package everything together and we just use npm to install app so rather than using grunt and then going oh crap the module i want to use is actually published on component now i have to set up browser now i have to set up um bower and component oh now there's something i need to use on npm now i have to set up bower and component and npm and then the bower and component have to get cloned and then build it and it's all this big mess. NPM, it's already built when you install it and everything is generally published to NPM these days. So it's huge, like NPM is amazing. There's a reason why it's getting such good attraction. So we covered all this um, and I covered, so now you know we started getting our data in and we're starting to do pretty nifty things um, and we started you know, getting an architecture going where we can split it out and start using no dependencies like Query Engine and Backbone. But let's, let's take an example of how we want to render a list. Right? We want to get this list that we had. Um, right? How would we actually go about rendering something like this? Well, what makes this interest this application interesting, what makes this a complex application as well, is just like how with bug herd um, we had this thing of do 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 this when we have to start dealing with multiple collections, it actually becomes quite an issue, right? So I said earlier we have a global collection. This is now a child collection, that's a child collection, that's a child collection. Now, if we click task board, then we want to show these things. Now, if we were to do this as, you know, just, just like a half-hearted way, which is probably the way most of JavaScript people do it, is when they click this, then let's query our 1,000 tasks in the database for everything that is in task board and everything that's in backlog. Let's query everything in our entire database for everything in task board and in to-do. Let's query everything in our entire data database for everything in task board and in dojo. Or done, I think it is. I wonder what it actually is. I can't read it, right? And then done. Right, so you end up querying everything many, many times and it's very slow. And then if people are changing these things on multiple computers at the same time, that's a whole lot of querying and it's just gonna fall down. So there's this idea in Query Engine um, which is why we created it. Um, so Query Engine at its most basic sense gives you NoSQL queries for collections with, um, with backbone collections. Um, probably the example is like a good way to start this off, right? So if these are my models, right, I can create a collection and I can find everything that has has the tag jQuery, all right? So a NoSQL MongoDB style query. Now, this is all fine and good, but it still means every single time I run this, I have to query the database every single time. So if I make this something like, um, like task board or in task board, right? Maybe board um, current, right? And then sub board backlog, right? And then I do these queries for many different things and I end up doing it. it. It becomes very slow. So there's another way we can do this. 
which is a live collection. In which case we create a live collection and we set this query. So the exact same thing. But then what happens is when we add our models to it, it actually, so a model is added, an event is fired that says, hey, we now have these new models and it matches these new models against the query, right? So it still fetches the same results, but it's doing it via events rather than querying everything on a one-off basis. So as new data is coming in, it just matches it against the criteria that we have. So if a change happens to our model, then um, you know this event is fired, it then says, okay, this no longer matches our query. So if we look at it here, let's say I, I change this task, I drag this task into doing. What will then happen is uh, the backbone will fire an event on the model, which will then say, um, the status of this task is now changed to to do, right? This event gets fired on the global collection. These collections listen to the global collection because the children of the global collection, and then they would say, okay, does this change affect my current criteria? Well, it's just the status. It hasn't changed which board it's in. So the, it still passes. Then the change will then fire on the sub collection. And then it will say, okay, does this, let's say for this collection, does this change affect which task, I, which group I'm in? It does or it doesn't. Um, so in this case, it doesn't affect it. I'm not in here anymore. On this one, it say it w would affect it. So remove us from this view. And here I'd say it does affect us, so, well, remove us from this collection, and it does affect us, add us to this collection, right? So it actually makes it so, instead of us querying everything all the time, we just query things when we just have to. So our collections are always up to date, and it's always really fast. We could put in like thousands of tasks into this, and it will still be just as fast, which is a really nifty way of doing this. Now, if we're doing this in... Um, like a reactive way, like that, that's great for the models, but it doesn't help us with the views. But if we use this pointer library, um, we have, so you could either do this via, if you want to keep your views up to date with, with the, the models, then you have the choice of Facebook React um, or Knockout.js, right? So you have, you can write it like this, or we can start using this idea of pointers. Now, if we take a look at this in terms of how it looks inside the inline GUI thing, let's find out. Da da da, views, file. File, da da da. I think it's actually inside the app. Let's see, files. I'm going to have to reduce my font so I can just find it. So, this is when a route gets hit. Um, if we're not on any site, just show the first page. If we do have a site selected, then let's um, fetch our collections. And <coughs> if we do have, um, da, 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 da. yeah, fetch our collections, make sure it's up to date with the database, and get our files. Now, if we have no files selected, then let's just show our file listing. So, this file listing um, that we see on the inline GUI side. Um, here, all of this is just done by us creating a file list item. So we just have our HTML here. We have this row file, content row file. We grab, okay, so it's in the files. So in the content table files, grab the content row, um, this content row, pull it out at runtime, remove it, grab the property. Now we have the title, we have tags, we have date um, in part of this, right? So we just say how this piece of content should interact with our model. Now we use pointers here um, by saying, okay, this is reflecting a particular file. So point the files attributes title, none, relative path to the title element, which is here. Now, we want to use a custom setter here, so grab the title, fall back to the name if it's not set, and also show where the path of the file is. If it has a title, then show the title and the path, otherwise just show the path, and create that. If we got tags, tags is an array, so join the array and comma separate it. And if we have a date, then display, display it with the local date string. So that handles this, and it handles this. 
but it listens to the model's events so this stays up to date automatically for us we don't have to do anything it stays up to date now if i want to have it so this actually renders a collection for each of the things then i can just say point the files collection with the view file list item which is the view i defined here to the files element and then it does it it, it injects all the creates the views for each item and it listens for events and it does everything that is the entire listing of that view or of that list something that has been previously incredibly difficult now it does it with memory management and it does it with you know deleting all the old events and just a really simple api so it's really quite cool so if i want to like start hacking this up and then be like okay let's remove an item so window app current file collection get files um, at zero um, so I'll say file files so let's remove the second item in this list which is this one right so that's all handled for free with that one line of code which is really nice <laughs> like, um, and then here we do the same thing where but this time it's not this render the current file that we have um, sorry here render the current file with the view file edit item and bind it to the page edit container so when we click on one of these it sets that up for us handles all the management ha all the memory management handles the destruction and everything like that for us so it's really quite nice now finally um, we have a server-side communication we're still figuring that out I'll probably amend this later so I won't cover that in this talk um, and we also have the routing so instead of including all the spine just for the routing I just pulled out the routing from spine and it turned out it just worked which is really good so you can just use this by itself um, without any of the rest of the spine you can just use the routes um, so that's kind of the architecture it is it's probably a bit more confusing than I hope but at least this is the first time I talked about it so there's lots of nifty stuff in there and it'll be cool to put this together in a more easygoing talk and a more consolidated easier to digest talk than something like this but it you know it's a github project and you know by sure it's going to get updated as things progress so um, that's it the products you know everything's on github you can clone it out you can yell at me by issues if you hate it um, and yeah I'll take questions now if anyone has questions here yes all right blowing everybody's minds <laughs> yeah. all right cool well I'll put this up in uh, added to the link. Thanks everybody here for attending. There is actually people you can see him. See, so it's not just me. Um, so yeah, it, it's I like it, and um, feel free to message me and make it better as well. Thanks.